They say success is 5% inspiration and 95% perspiration. In reality, timing, environment, money, connections, and even luck also play a big role in bringing new solutions to market. So today, we want to take a look at how innovation, both in AI and elsewhere, is sparked, identified, and developed into viable technologies that advance industries and improve our lives. I'm Tomasz Koper, and this is Connected on Taiwan Plus. If you're an innovator or entrepreneur, share your thoughts and ideas with us on our social media. Some of them may even inspire future episodes. And in the meantime, let me introduce today's guests who will be walking us through the life cycle of innovation. In Taipei, we have Evie Tai. She is the Director of Business Development at Qualcomm and leads the company's ecosystem development program in Asia. And joining us from Tokyo, we have Yuki Shirado, the Managing Director of Techstars Tokyo. Now, Yuki, I want to start with you here. What do you think is a stronger driver of innovation? Market and financial forces or solving universal problems that we all face? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't think it's clearly dichotomous. Uh, I think innovation could come in very different forms and then could be driven by market forces uh, or a problem or the pain points of the customers. Uh, so I think that innovation uh, can come from anywhere and then basically anywhere in the world and any space. Um, so it is, uh, I think, uh, that's the, I think, the beauty of innovation. Uh, innovation can be driven by a person uh, who has a vision uh, where he or she wants to be or go, right? Uh, or or the someone has a very um, problem uh, every day uh, in everyday life and then wants to solve it. And then it becomes a gigantic movement that creates a huge market. So it could come in any form, uh, in my opinion. So I think the I'm not answering the question uh, directly, but I think uh, that's the beauty of innovation in my mind. Oh, uh, I mean, that's a great answer. And uh, I hope to kind of zero in on a few specifics later in the show. Uh, but Evie, I want to ask you first, um, many um, people, when they hear innovation, they think patents and, and you know, holding the exclusive right to use a, uh, some kind of technology. Um, do you think that patents uh, and patent grants are a good measure of innovation? And, and are they always good and beneficial to fostering innovation? Mm, I think in our view, patent definitely plays a very key role in spurring innovation and also a key driver of the economic growth. And you, as you <clears throat> might know, um, patents are very important business model for Qualcomm too. And we do believe that uh, IP protection can effectively foster the innovation and also help the staff to develop and uh, uh, this is a powerful tool for them to be able to compete in the global markets. And from our observation with a very limited resource, this is also an area where we see the staff uh, or entrepreneurs might not have the time or priority to look into. So we actually provide some training program on the intellectual property partition, uh, try to empower these uh, in inventors and entrepreneurs to understand IP right and ensure they uh, plan their uh, IP strategy globally ahead of time. But meanwhile, I think it's not only about IP. We also look into uh, some main perspective while we consider the staff for our incubation programs, uh, like pro the problem, the founders, and how relevant to Qualcomm are very key for us to be able to support their journey. So what can they describe the what kind of the problem they're trying to solve and the practical need for the region or for the industry? And also, why are you doing, why are you do you have like strong motivation or relevant experience in the industry? And also how relevant to Qualcomm, how we can support you through a journey? Do we have a, a platform or a technology that can fit your need for your company growth? So I think in addition to IP, we do also look into this uh, different area, uh, then try to identify good company that we can work and support along the, their journey. 
Well, um, I, I do have a question specifically about the, the programs that you run for innovators. Uh, but before uh, we look into that, um, since you mentioned patents and how important they are, Let's take a quick look at the U.S. Patent Leaderboard, the top 10 companies to obtain patent grants in the country last year. Samsung took the top spot with over 6,000 patents, followed by Taiwan's own TSMC with just under 4,000. Qualcomm, uh, your company, EV, rounds off the top three with over 3,400 patent grants. But despite so many Asian companies featured in the top 10, when we look at the distribution of U.S. patents by country of origin, we see that most of them come exactly from there, the USA. Japan, China, South Korea and Taiwan seem to trail somewhat behind, together with a number of European countries and Canada. So, Yuki, uh, what is the U.S. doing differently that puts it so far ahead of other innovators? So uh, the innovation uh, requires, I think, uh, three things. Uh, one is capital, and then second is top talent, and third is uh, entrepreneurial um, sort of spirit in the culture, right? And then I think U.S. has all three. And then especially the financial markets is the biggest in the world. So immigration uh, is one. Uh, there are a lot of top talent uh, moving to the U.S. for higher education and stay and then start uh, uh, starting up a business. That's uh, a very um, important element. Uh, you don't generally see any other parts of the world, right? I, I think that China and the U.S. are leading in the technological innovation now, but uh, I don't see many immigrants come into China and starting a business in China, right? So the U.S. has an advantage of attracting top talent from abroad and then uh, making them start up a business there. So that's a one thing. And then also I think the skills uh, and the experiences and, and then the people are uh, not um, uh, isolated. They um, support each other, they help each other, and then they create a community and then community gets bigger and bigger. So once you become an innovator or an exit entrepreneur uh, or supporter, uh, angel investor uh, or whatever startups, uh, I think you will create a community and then you become um, a more of a supporter and then you create more support uh, system uh, within the community. So I think that's what is happening in, in Japan, which I will uh, get to later, and then also Taiwan and then other parts of the world uh, where the startup ecosystem is growing. Well, uh, Evie, you mentioned people before and kind of uh, the, the innovators that um, you work with, um, but you are the lead of three different innovation programs across Asia, so including the Qualcomm Innovate in Taiwan Challenge. Um, so besides people, what, what kind of technologies are you keeping an eye on? What really matters is not about the technology, it's about, still about the industrial challenge and how to address the challenge. So no matter they are using AI or other technology, the most important thing we are seeing, we want to identify and discuss with the founder are still about the industrial challenge and how they try to address that. So, but the question is, why not leverage AI now? So, the technology advancement are always a very usable catalyst for innovation and can drive a lot of change across industry and sectors quickly. And we saw rapid technology improvement in AI, like AI platform, development tools, AI models. Why not embrace them and exploring the possibility of leveraging AI to assist the, to address the industry challenge in a more effective way? So I think it's also a question I would ask the founders if they are not considering to use AI now. It's not because AI is a very key technology. Of course it is, but it's also about we want to understand the view and the strategy of the founder uh, about the technology they are choosing to address the issue they're trying to uh, uh, solve. Well, uh, like I said, I want to dig into AI a little later in the program. Uh, but, but Yuki, um, what, what factors do you look at to identify innovation um, through your accelerator program at uh, Techstar Tokyo? What I see is the founders. Uh, so founders is the key because Techstars uh, basically invest in early stage pre-seed uh, uh, companies. So we are the lar uh, world's largest uh, pre-seed investor and accelerator. 
and what we look at are basically founders. Uh, sometimes they have even attraction or angel investments or even VC capital, but they are so early that they have no idea what their journey is going to be in three years, five years or seven years. So the idea changes, the company might change, the name may change, their target market change, anything could change, but the founders remain, right? They are at the core of the company, they are the drivers. Um, so we basically, I uh, especially look at the founders, uh, what they are passionate about, why are they obsessed with this problem? And do they have the grit? Do they have the persistence? But do they also have the flexibility to pivot or change their minds if they need to? If the market doesn't agree with them, do they have the mindset of you know understanding what's happening and, and then changing themselves? So I think the founders, 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 uh, that's the most uh, relevant answer to me. Well, speaking of shifting mindsets, uh, Yuki, you, you wrote in the past about young Japanese people uh, changing their mindset, going through a cultural shift where they are no longer willing to work for one company for life, but instead want to strike out on their own and become entrepreneurs and become um, innovators. Um, so how much has that impacted the, the quality and the number of startups that you're seeing? Right. So uh, exactly like you said, I think Japan has uh, been stagnating in, in terms of you know economic growth for decades now. And a lot of young people are disillusioned, but also becoming more realistic that they would not stick to the one company for the rest of their lives uh, professionally. And then they would like to innovate. They would like to start up something. They would like to build something that could revolutionize or changes the lives of other people. So I think the spirit entrepreneur mindset uh, shift is uh, definitely happening. And then I see it uh, in terms of capital, right? The BC capital has tenfold uh, as compared to 10 years ago in Japan and then top talent from the top universities in Japan or the PhDs or you know other advanced degrees coming from abroad coming back to Tokyo and then trying to start uh, a, a, the new company or the new innovation uh, platform here. So I think that a lot of returnees and then a lot of uh, local talents are um, uh, starting up uh, uh, creating a, a interesting uh, startup ecosystem and also I have to add a lot of foreigners are moving to Japan and they try to start up, up a business here so uh, last year's uh, class uh, I had like a one a foreign American entrepreneur who started a company in Japan and and then this year I have seen so many more applications from within Japan but are started by foreign founders and I myself co-founded three companies and and two of them were with the co-founders from abroad so I think the foreign uh, entrepreneurs are coming to Japan and then starting up and then creating this startup ecosystem as well. Well, Evie, what about Taiwan? Are we seeing a similar cultural shift, a similar shift in mindsets among young Taiwanese entrepreneurs here? I think each region has its uh, unique industry outlook and talent profile and the regional need. And uh, from my observation for the Taiwan uh, ecosystem, I think for Taiwan, uh, we should all agree there are many good R&D talents across both software and hardware here, and particularly good and uh, like hardware software integration, or, and also team could get access to the world's uh, leading manufacturer partners in Taiwan for prototyping or for uh, product commercialization. So I think this makes Taiwan a very good place for product development, prototype, testing, and commercialization. And uh, uh, we see lots of innovation in like smart manufacturing or healthcare biotech in Taiwan, because for these two areas, we have good talents and also good test bed uh, for pilot customers and uh, to drive lots of uh, initial business. And the other important aspect uh, is uh, I think I like what Yuki shared about the international founders uh, spirit in Japan ecosystem. In Taiwan, we don't have that many of international founders, but we do see lots of Taiwanese. They study in the U.S. and come back to Taiwan and work with uh, the Taiwan friend and start their business in Taiwan. So there are some mix and match uh, founding team in Taiwan. 
And the uh, most important thing is many of the Taiwan people really welcome international partners because um, there's a Taiwan market itself is a small small market compared to the Japan market. So I think for from the large corporate to the SME or for the staff, we all know we have to collaborate with the international partners and try to bring our product to the global market. So this global mindset in Taiwan actually, I think leads Taiwan to be a very unique position uh, for international collaborations. Well, perhaps some of those future international founders are among our viewers. Which great tech ideas failed to get off the ground because of timing, money, or other reasons? Let us know in the comments below. Click the video beside me for a discussion of how much AI innovation is too much. And subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell if you don't want to miss more stories on tech and business from Taiwan.